Okay, guys, good afternoon. Uh, there was one or two questions uh, for when the midterm will be. So the midterm is set for 16th of May. Huh? So just note that down. I also will uh, give the announcement to all of the class. So uh, May 16th. Uh, today we will also uh, finish the assignment for the homework and that homework then will be due uh, next week, Thursday. Uh, this week you also will start your uh, practica. Uh, any questions so far uh, on the course? Uh, by the way, we are going very fast, so I'm very happy. Uh, you guys have covered already quite a bit of material. Uh, so that's excellent. Of course, there will be a bit of a break now. Uh, as you do your uh, practica, things will slow down a bit. Uh, by the way, uh, I might lose my voice uh, during my class today. I have a bit of cold. Germany was quite cold last week, so, and I just got back late yesterday night. So what we will do today is uh, we're going to start the class by asking you some questions on the lithography class you got, just to see if you guys followed uh, Swati 2 classes uh, from last week. I'm going to ask some questions that you might well see in the midterm or in the final. And then we're going to start a class that's really an application of lithography. It's a class on carbon MEMS, class 6. But so before I project that class, why don't I ask some questions to see uh, how much you, you carried through from the lithography class. So one question I might ask, I'm going to see if you guys uh, could come up with the answer right here. Uh, what is the relation between depth of focus and resolution in lithography? How does that work? Can you say something about these two quantities? The inverses, the inverses right? So, the bigger the depth of focus, typically the, the worse the resolution gets. Be always careful when people ask questions about resolution. You know, they, they might ask you if the re resolution gets worse or better. And of course, the better resolution, what does it mean? It's, it means smaller and smaller features, right? So if people say a smaller resolution, you might in your mind say, oh, that means worse. Right? So always read the sentence carefully. Uh, before answering. Uh, so yeah, you're right, uh, depth of focus, if you have a big depth of focus, you're likely not to resolve things very well. Okay, let's apply that. Suppose I have a very, very poor depth of focus. Can I do fat photoresists? Say you cannot, right? Because what really does depth of focus mean? It means you project your image with high fidelity throughout the depth of your photoresist. So you should always check at minimum that your photoresist is thin compared to the depth of focus, right? So that makes sense. Now, what was one key equation you saw that determines resolution? I had actually mentioned it beforehand, right? So it's R resolution equals? It's the inverse of? So it's proportional to? No, resolution. So what goes into determining resolution? We have the numerical aperture. And we have lambda, the wavelength of the light. And we have a constant K1, right? So overall, I gave you this big rule of thumb. What was it? One rule of thumb was at 100 microns, we switch from CNC machining to lithography. Now, within the field of lithography, I gave you another rule of thumb in terms of the size of the features you can draw with lithography. That will be roughly, what did I say? Say? I believe it's 10 microns or so. No. So it's a good rule of thumb to have. So if you have a certain lithography, ask at what wavelength are you exposing your resist. That wavelength will be very roughly the same as the size of the minimum feature you can create. So say you're using 196 nanometers, 
you could expect 196 nanometer resolution. In reality, it's better. In reality, you know, lithography specialists have become so good, they can actually do 10 times better than the wavelength of the light they're using. That's quite fascinating. That, that's actually what some of you guys might end up doing. That is getting more out of light than nature gives you. You know, that sub wavelength lithography, a very important field out there. If you Google that, you'll see plenty, plenty of activity worldwide. Sub wavelength lithography, meaning you're getting more out of that wavelength, you know, than the wavelength. You can do maybe one tenth the size of what the wavelength that you're using is. Uh, was there any other questions that you guys had about that class of lithography? Because that class is given now, I will only touch upon it very, very briefly a little bit later in this course because I want to introduce Moore's law and I think Swati did not get to discuss that, is that right? Right, Moore's law, did that come up? I don't think so. Right, so that is something I will add uh, at the end of that class. Then in terms of soft lithography, obviously you're all set. That's what you will be doing in the lab. So today, instead of continuing the last class where we were talking about what kind of machining? Just refresh your memory, where were we? You remember first classes were mechanical machining, right? Then the second group of classes were what? Thermal, right? So we're talking about laser machining, EDM machining. So I will get back to that, but because this class here on carbon MEMS fits so well with lithography, I decided to give it now. Because lithography is fresh in your mind, and we're gonna do an application of lithography that you really, I think, will enjoy. So the class is a little bit different in the sense that it will be more like a detective story. I will tell you a story on how we started recognizing that perhaps instead of micro-machining and nano-machining in silicon, we could use carbon instead. So that will be the story. Uh, by the way, a good exercise in terms of lithography would be this. When you do photolithography, could you characterize that in terms of manufacturing group? What is that? Is it additive, subtractive? Is it thermal, etc.? Because you know you're gonna get one question like that. I might ask, characterize laser micromachining in terms of all of the different fields, characteristic, characteristics we have seen in manufacturing, right? So maybe try that in the case of lithography. How would you characterize that? Is that batch? Is it serial, eh? etc. So with all of that, let's get started on the class for today. So as I told you, it will be a little bit of a different class, different in style. It will be treating you more like adults, meaning like, you know, full-blown researchers. So the title of the class is Carbon MEMS, and I'm going to specifically use this Carbon MEMS to make something that will look like a washcloth. I will fabricate, machine, a structure that has two posts, and in between these posts is a carbon nanowire. And in doing that, you will learn about lithography, you will learn about pyrolysis, you will learn about spinning. All manufacturing techniques you need to know. All right, so, but I'm doing it by organizing this around making this specific thing. Now, why would I want to have a washcloth like that, right? What the heck would I use that for? Well, imagine that these clothes are not clothes, but they are molecules. Each of these is a DNA molecule. And say that one of these DNA molecules hybridizes with its complementary fraction. If that happens, a charge distribution takes place and the current through the wire changes. In other words, we are proposing this as a new nanosensor approach. That's why I want to make this thing. Now what is carbon MEMS means? Microelectromechanical systems, that's MEMS. Usually 95% of the world is doing it in silicon. Our group for about 15 years has now pushed to do everything in carbon. Make things in carbon. And I'll explain you why. 
So that's what I'm going to cover. Carbon MEMS or NEMS, MEMS if it's micro, NEMS if it's nano. I'm going to first tell you what it is. And then I'm going to tell you after these 14, 15 years, how many applications have come out already about this, including uh, a micro battery company, Innovate, here just off campus. Uh, then I will tell you the topic of this class, the, me, the key new application, that is the wash line nanosensors. And I'm doing this work here at UC Irvine, but also in collaboration with IIT Kanpur in India and UNIST in Korea. And very recently, we actually have found that this manufacturing technique that we stumbled upon to make these wires could be a new approach to making structural colors. So you will also learn something about structural colors today. Right? And then some conclusions. The bottom bullet point, I think by now you guys are aware of this, right? DIMPS, what did it stand for again? Do you remember? Desktop Integrated is it on there? Thank you. <laughs> I saw that, you're fast. You have a good memory. I forgot it was on there. Yes, you're right. Uh, by the way, there's a website you might want to visit uh, on DIMPS. This is our idea about where manufacturing in the US should go to in the future. Uh, the cartoons on the right, the top one, is what inspired our idea of trying to find a way to manufacture suspended carbon wires. You know that thing you see there, these three, four posts pulled together, everything you see there is carbon, including the wires pulling it together. But we made it by accident. I said, damn, if we could make this on purpose, this would be great, right? Is something happening? <laughs> I see you. Okay, <laughs> yeah, that thing. So it took us indeed about six, seven years to make this thing on purpose. We could get it by accident, but manufacturing you cannot do by accident, right? You should be able to reproduce it. And so I will tell you kind of historically how we eventually found a way to make that thing look more like you see in the second slide there, where you see looking from the top these posts, carbon posts, and the thin line connecting them is this carbon wire or wash line, and that's where we want to hang these molecules on. Hmm? The third uh, picture at the bottom is actually an example of structural color. And so let me tell you already, for those who don't know what structural color is, a lot of animals that we see out there have colors not because of a paint, a dye. They have colors because in their feathers or in their skin, there's nano elements organized, architectured a certain way as to give you those colors. In other words, the peacock feather you see there, this has nothing to do with the dye. If you look at SEM level, you will actually see repeating structures, nanostructures, that are organized such that when light comes in, electromagnetic radiation interacts with these structures as to give off that light. Now, why is that interesting? Well, a lot of the colors we use, think about your t-shirts, you wash them a couple of times, or it's in the sun too much, it fades. Now, if you could make a structural color, you can use a material for its mechanical property, so it will last very long. That means your mechanical color, because in a way it's a mechanical color, will last much longer. So we could have be surrounded by colors that last forever. Plus, we could make small changes, because maybe these nanostructures could be changing in distance, and we could choose the color of our living room day by day. Right? So that has become a very important research field, especially for people looking at nanomanufacturing techniques. How could I do that? How could I make structural colors as nature has been doing for so many uh, eons? So let's get started with what is carbon MEMS. And it starts as so often uh, with an example from nature. Uh, for those in the audience that are artists, you might have worked with charcoal. You know what charcoal is, right? You can draw with that and make nice uh, carbon drawings, basically. It's, it's like a fat pencil, isn't it? Now, where does that come from, charcoal? It's probably one of the first things mankind did, right, making charcoal. You can imagine sitting around the fireplace and wood that's not completely burned 
right? And maybe uh, they had been drinking too much, and this guy is sitting next to the other one, just making them a mustache. <laughs> oh, they start laughing, right? They found color, black color. Now, how is that made? Well, you have on the left a twig of wood, and if you go from A to D, D is a blow up where you actually see the wood cells, the cellulose cells. Uh, keep that in mind. Now I take that piece of wood and I put it in a kiln. That's a 19th century furnace. Basically what you do is pyrolysis or carbonization. So you heat wood at high temperature but you exclude oxygen. Uh, because if you have oxygen, you have CO, CO2, you burn it. You don't want to burn it, right? So carbonization is the process where you heat an organic precursor such as wood at high temperature. Hydrogen comes off, sulfur comes off, and that's the interesting thing about carbon. Carbon atoms like to polymerize with themselves. So the carbons reconnect, and the hydrogen comes off, carbons reconnect. And the intriguing thing is, and that was my student Benjamin Park, he took a piece of pyrolyzed carbon on the right, and do you see these hexagons in there? What does that remind you of, these hexagons? These are the same as the hexagons in the wood. When we saw that, we said, wow, that is amazing. Because you're going <coughs> to 900,000 degrees C. And the structure in the wood is preserved. And that gave us the idea. The idea was this. If I pattern an organic material, I could do it with CNC machining. I could do it with lithography, as we will do today and then pyrolyze this thing, I can make anything in carbon that I can make a precursor of and pattern. Hmm? I'm going to repeat that. Carbon is a very difficult material to machine. Well, you know that if you try to machine carbon, it will break. But what I do here is I have a trick. I machine the plastic, the polymer, the precursor, and I heat that and I convert it to carbon. So now my group is able to make carbon structures that no one else in the world can make with unprecedented fineness of features and complexity. So now comes the application of the class on lithography. That's what he told you all about. So we go to the first picture there, A, on the left. I have a substrate, put on a photoresist, and I expose the photoresist with UV light through a mask that has holes. Now I'm gonna tell you it's negative tone photoresist, so you remember from that class, what does that mean? Where light strikes the photoresist? You have one other choice. <laughs> it's a negative. negative photoresist. Yeah, it's the opposite. Eh? So when you have negative photoresist, it polymerizes more, becomes stronger. So where light hits, material forms. And where light has not seen the material, you can still dissolve it away. So that means that after exposure, what do I have? I have that substrate, maybe silicon, with posts, polymer posts. Now these posts are still polymer, right? They are this photoresist, in this case called SU8. Now comes the thing that we did that no one else had done. That is, we just take these SU8 posts from here and convert them into carbon. And look what happens. The shape is preserved. Just like the shape from the organic cell is preserved in the carbon, the shape of the post is preserved. So in other words, things shrink, but they shrink isometrically. That's another bonus, isn't it? Because you might do microtechnology, but shrink them into the nanotechnology. So you could make nano features while working on a lesser uh, accurate technology because it shrinks into the nano domain. Hmm? So now more, this thing, so you see the post there on the top screen, and here you see how they have shrunk into carbon. So I have basically gone from a low Young's modulus floppy photoresist to a hard carbon structure. Uh, so mechanical properties have changed completely, plus 
if I measure the conductivity now of these materials as a function of temperature. Ignore this point here. These are two different types of photoresist. You can see that the sheet resistance goes from insulator, right, photoresist, to a conductor, almost metallic. So that was the invention. That's the idea. So let's summarize what carbon MEMS is. It's a method to make things in carbon from organic precursors. So in nature, you know, you could take a frog and take out the lungs and carbonize it, and you would have made what? What? Tiny carbon frog worms? Uh, uh, yes, that are fractals, right? So I want to have you give. I know, I wanted you to give the clever answer, but <laughs> everyone understood. <laughs> But you don't want to sacrifice frogs to make better batteries, right? So uh, we would want to find another method to create these fractals. Uh, so uh, structures in carbon that are very hard to fabricate in any other way. Carbon is hard to machine. Now, OK, how does that carbon kind of look like? Is it diamond? Uh, is it amorphous? Is it graphite, right? So what we found. And pay close attention, because this class, you will see, it's really like being detective. Uh, and it will show you why it's so much fun to actually be a scientist. Because you can become, uh, yeah, like a detective. Because there's some surprising things happening. And here you will see the surprising things. We found originally that close to the surface, this is an SEM picture. Uh, of photoresist being carbonized. And you could see a little bit of structure here, lines. But mostly, it looks amorphous. So the conclusion was that basically, when you carbonize an organic material in the bulk, you mostly get something called glassy carbon. Glassy carbon has the structure shown here in the middle. It shows these loopy kind of structures, and that is because it has domains with six rings in these planes here. Then when it bends up, there's seven rings. When it bends down, there's five rings. You actually probably can relate to that if you know carbon nanotubes. On the body of a carbon nanotube, you have six rings. Now to cap it off, you have five rings. And that capping off would go like this. In this case, we also have seven rings when the sheets bend up. By the way, this is still very controversial. People are still kind of trying to understand what glassy carbon is really like. But the model about two, three years ago that most people now have agreed upon is they think it looks something like that. Now, glassy carbon is a very important technical material. Any electrochemist that wants to do a good electrochemistry experiment, he will buy expensive glassy carbon electrodes. So there we say, wow, I have a photoresist, I pattern it, and I can convert it to any shape glassy carbon electrode I want. Quite magic, right? I couldn't buy those. They would be way too expensive. I have found a way to kind of shunt machining carbon out of big glassy carbon chunks. Because all I need to do is I pattern my photoresist and I convert them. And voila, I have these classic carbon structures. So then in fast procession, what happened? We found, uh, so bullet, second bullet point you understand, right? Except close to the silicon substrate surface, we saw a little bit of graphitic. In graphitic, you would just see what? You would just see graphite planes, right? It would all look like this, very organized. And we only saw that close to the surface. In the bulk, it was glassy, eh? like, like this. Now, electrochemically, we found quickly that this material indeed behaves like these glassy carbon electrodes you buy. And so here, you see a cyclic voltammogram, where we cycle the voltage and monitor the current. And this curve is for a commercial bought glassy carbon. And this is for our fabricated carbon. In electrochemistry, people want to, see, want to see these two peaks. They are called redox peaks, very close together. What that means is that carbon gives and takes electrons very reversibly. 
And so we found that all the material derived from a photoresist behaves as good, if not better, than the carbons that you buy so expensively. Then we worked with Bruce Dunn at UCLA, and we found that that carbon can also intercalate lithium. What that means is lithium can go inside the material. And that is the basis of your battery in your uh, cell phone. These are lithium ion batteries. And so even at that very early stage, we said, oh, wow, we might actually have a new way of making lithium ion batteries. And it's one of the many applications that indeed have, have been realized. But so, so far, remember mostly this, that if I convert that polymer into carbon, I end up mostly with glassy carbon. So make a note of that, because then you, you will later see, huh, maybe not. Maybe it's not always true. And that's what makes you think, right? You, you have this notion, it ought to be like this, because the professor told you, or you read it, and then suddenly it doesn't work out. That's when it becomes fun, because you know something else is going on. But so, so far, we believe we will get glassy carbon. So a little bit more. We know that the material shrinks, right? You saw that uh, when these posts are in the polymer shape. If I heat them, they heat, uh, they, heat they shrink. So, the shrinkage from polymer to glassy carbon is very substantial. And for the smallest structures, and now this is the second point I want you to pay attention to. What I'm plotting here is roughly on the left side is percentage of shrinkage. First is the height of SU8 posts. So you remember these posts here? These posts. And so now I'm making them in a variety of heights. This is the height of these posts. And on the left is the percentage of shrinkage. And look what you see. If the post is about 300 microns, the shrinkage is, let's say, 60%. But what is so intriguing is that the smaller the feature, the more it shrinks. Look, if I have something that's, let's say, 10 microns, 2 microns, the shrinkage is as much as 80%. And so we were very, very, very happy about seeing that. Hmm? So, so far, remember two things. You expect for small features the shrinkage to be as much as 80 to 90 percent, and you expect this carbonization to lead to mostly glassy carbon, right? See my second bullet point, I couldn't tell it enough. Remember this because it will be very important to follow my story here today. Uh, by the way, the, the, in blue every time, these are papers uh, that we published on the topics I'm covering. So I hope this class convinces you that micro-manufacturing, nano-manufacturing, advanced manufacturing is more than theory and learning a whole bunch of things. It leads to really fascinating new research results, you'll see. So a little intermezzo before I go back onto my story of making that carbon nanowire. These are the applications that have come out of this work so far. Smart batteries in any shape. Suppose that you have a ball, and if you buy a battery now, you will buy a rectangular battery. A lot of space is wasted. But in my case, I can make the battery any shape, because I remember, remember I start from a polymer. So I can make a polymer ball, convert it into carbon, and voila, I have a, a, you know, a spherical battery. So we can make batteries in any shape. We also, and I will not go into details, can charge, this, sorry, charge them faster, and we can reconfigure them. In other words, we can set them up uh, for the smartest power uh, consumption. Uh, if you have high current or uh, high voltage need, you can switch the configuration of the battery elements. So you could call it power management is within the battery. And you can check, there's a, a company on the web now, Innovate, that came out of this research group with several of our uh, UCI students. Uh, that are building this lithium-ion battery. Second bullet point, uh, so UCI and innovators, people involved in the battery, in redox amplification, we are using these electrodes to make a new type of amperimetric sensor that can be maybe as sensitive as an optical fluorescent-based sensor. 
There it says we have seen amplification of the current as much as 27. Um, by now, we are more than 40. So in other words, if I use a regular sensor, I get current one. If I use this kind of redox amplification sensors based on carbon MEMS, we can go up to 40 times the current level. A very, very good uh, development. So much so that we think that these sensors, they could be made small enough and pick up uh, neurotransmitters uh, inside biological cells. And that's one of the applications they're working on in Lund in Sweden. Uh, and we are also developing this work at UNIST in Korea. We also have done 3D dielectrophoresis, where we have higher specification efficiency for separating uh, white and red blood cells. That's done at UCI and EPFL. EPFL is in Lausanne, Switzerland. I will not go and I will not ask you to know each of these applications, unless you guys are very interested and want to check it out by yourself. But I guess you all know what a battery is, right? So, We also have worked uh, here at UCI uh, on using this carbon approach for fuel cells. And we have a couple of publications on that. With Jan Schoers in Yale, we use our carbon MEMS for molds. But so that's all uh, out there. What we are now interested in is this making suspended carbon nanowires for making these wash lines. So, and we succeeded. It was published in Nano Letters last year, March. You can actually see here that we wrote continuous for an hour. We can write polymer lines on any substrate, 2D or 3D, and then convert them into carbon. But it took a long way to get there. How do you do that? How do I write continuously these nano lines? Uh, some of the people in my group uh, at one point, at least, we're hoping to set up a company around this. Unfortunately, they found a job at Intel, and the idea is hanging there now. I hope someone else picks it up, though. Anyway, so now, back into the story, what I want to make is that thing, right, on the top right there. And you remember, when I made it originally, it was made by accident. So I need to find a method to fabricate, machine uh, that structure. I'm going to tell you now, why I'm so eager to do that. What are the advantages of this suspended carbon nanowire? And I have the advantages listed here in a table. You can forget about this part of the table. You can even scratch it if you want. Uh, it's enough that you understand the left side of that table. And this tells you not only why carbon nanowires suspended as we do them um, are so interesting. It will tell you also why are people really interested in nanotechnology? What's so great about a nanosensor? if anything. That's all in that table. So let's get started. This is a point, the first bullet point I actually already made to you several times. Look, a nanowire is almost all surface. Isn't it, right? The surface to volume argument. If you have a nanowire, this thing is all surface. There's almost no bulk. Now what is a sensor? A sensor is a surface that interacts with the environment and changes. So, if I have a change on the surface, and that influences a current in that nanowire, it will do it much, much, much more sensitively because there's more surface to volume. And so, a nanowire is almost all surface, and any surface change translates in a very large, large resistance change. And I can measure that in that wire. So LOD stands for lower, what? Do you know what it stands for? LOD, does anyone know? It's lower limit of detection. So we can measure smaller amounts of the analyte of interest. Second, it avoids surrounding surface phenomena. You see, most nanotechnologies, nanosensors, are built in a surface. Eh? Now, surfaces are dirty. And if I have that nanowire sitting on a solid surface, you're almost bound to have some effect from the surrounding atoms. So what I have done is I have lifted the nanowire up. So now it does not, it's not surrounded by solid. It's surrounded by the analyte. Plus it's surrounded from all directions. 
if I have a nanowire on the surface, obviously nothing can approach it from the back. Right? So that's the third point. Suspended for access from all directions. And then fourthly, uh, this is an aspect that I don't touch upon in this class, but you will have higher mass transport to this nanowire. And so that's uh, due to nonlinear diffusion effects. So all these four reasons or reasons why people do nanotechnology in general, and then why I specifically go in my approach for a carbon nanowire. Okay, so now how did we get there? And so here you will see how kind of thinking in a science world works. And it also introduces a new manufacturing technique. We have had, for quite a long time now, a, a strong collaboration uh, with IIT Kanpur uh, in India. Uh, actually working very closely with Ashutosh Sharma and Chandra Shekhar, who was at that time his student, and Chandra is now also a professor of one of the new IITs. And actually that's Ashutosh smelling the roses or some flowers on campus in IIT Kanpur. And in this collaboration, uh, I introduced carbon MEMS, to, how to do carbon MEMS to India, but they were introducing to me this field of electrospinning. Now what is electrospinning? And then we'll bring these two together. Because the mind works best when you're exposed to something new. Have you thought about that? The most interesting phase about knowing someone new, well, that's a dangerous statement, actually, is the first couple of days. <laughs> Damn, what did I say? <laughs> but OK, at least for science, that's true, right? Uh, you meet someone, and they suddenly explain something from a very different direction, right? And so here we have. They were doing something called electrospinning. Now, what that is is you have a syringe. The syringe you fill up with a solution of a polymer. And at the end of the syringe, I mean, you have the needle tip, right? And say, here is the surface. Here is my syringe needle tip. And let's say I'm making this about 15 centimeters. I apply a very big voltage between this tip and the substrate. At a certain voltage, look, a droplet will come out, right, out of the needle. Now that droplet will look like a tear. Now when the electrostatic field is strong enough, that teardrop will start changing into a cone. That's called a Tyler cone there on the top. And that Tyler cone now issues a jet. Solvent is evaporating, and a polymer jet comes down. Now that polymer jet very quickly kind of becomes unstable, and you end up with a mess. You end up indeed with nanowires about 200, 300 nanometers thick, but it's a mat. And people have used this for ages. You can use it for making clothes. You can make it for scaffolds, for tissue engineering, and on and on and on. That has existed for a long time. So nothing new so far, right? Now what was the new idea? Huh. Suppose I load this needle with SU8. The same photoresist we made these posts in. What do you think will happen? So as a scientist, you're curious, right? So I now make a mat. And you're going to check, is that mat still photosensitive? So now I could project an image on that mat and pattern the photoresist. Right? So instead of patterning this film you saw before, now I'm patterning a thick layer of photoresist like you see there. And what would you end up with? Use your imagination. Suppose it works. What should you end up with? Patterned wires, right? And that's indeed what we saw. So let's read through it. So electrospinning, we will talk about today both near field and far field. And this is called far field because there's about 10 to 15 centimeter distance, right? Uh, leads to the production of mats of micro and nanopolymer fibers from solutions driven by electrical field. By the way, what would you do if you're a carbon MEM specialist? Eventually you would convert these fibers also to carbon, right? That's eventually what we will do. And you will then see how we eventually then ended up with being able to, instead of having these bunches of fibers, isolate just one. So think this through with me, kind of, how this all happened. So we were very happy about this idea. Hmm? 
uh, of putting SU8 uh, into the syringe. That happened in 2009, not all that long ago. We started electrospinning photoresistant far field and we found that they remain photopatternable. And this way we could structure carbon mats at the micro and nano level. And here you go. These are now pattern chunks of that mat. And so my photolithography allows me to, let's say, do micron features and within the mat structures nano lines, nano features. Hmm? This is after carbonization where it further shrinks. And so now suddenly you have this tool to make new sensors, new batteries, new fuel cells because they all need this. They need patterning at the micro and nano scale of carbon fiber. So this became a big thing, this insight that we could use these mats, make them photosensitive and pattern them the way you see it here. Hmm? So structure at the micro level with the photolithography, let's say 20 microns, and the nano level by electrospinning, let's say 200 nanometers. So these are all SEM pictures of a variety of such structures. You remember how I'm fascinated with fractals. Once I saw this, I knew we were closer to being able to make a fractal instead of taking the lung out of a frog and carbonize that. We would be able to pattern somehow structures that look like a carbonized lung of a frog. Are you guys still with me? It's so quiet today. What, what's happening? Yeah? Is it true? I hope that's true. <laughs> Okay, so what, what will we do next? Because this is not good enough, right? I, I'm still very far from that single fiber, so we need to get there. You wanna know how it worked? Okay, let's continue. Uh, this slide I will come back to when I talk about structural color. Make a note that electrospinning happens at one viscosity if you change the viscosity of that solution in the syringe, you can actually make bubbles, blots, balls. You do spraying instead of spinning. Just remember that, okay? I will need that later. So with that same machine, by the way, you can come see it in our lab when you do some of the experiments there. Please make sure you see that setup. It costs 10,000 or 12,000 dollars. So we do nanotechnology with something that costs 12,000 dollars. So now, next step, and it happened again between the three of us. Uh, I was in Korea, and we were writing up this first paper that showed this. Huh? Uh, but I, I said to uh, Ashutosh, and Chandra was there too, but I really want to get back to my idea of the suspended nanowires. And Chandra, th three weeks later, did the following. Still in far field, he takes a substrate with these posts on it. And now he electrospins, but a very short time, like three or four seconds. And you know what? He ended up with that. So this looks like this happened. You have a post here. The wire comes on and it wraps itself around one post. Then it goes to the next one, wraps itself there, goes to the next one, and so on. And so it looks closer already to what I want, right? I, you see the nanowires between the posts, but it's still very messy. I have like this glob of sugar spun material around each post. But it, that was progress, wasn't it? And so what is happening here, the same as before, but instead of making a mat, you know, it's the initiation. And where will the wire go first? To the points of highest electrical field. And these are the posts. Now, why does it go sideways? And people are still debating that. Why would it go, let's say, to this post first, because the field is the highest, it wraps itself around it, and then goes sideways. Would anyone have a hypothesis why that could be? We have one, uh, but <laughs> very far from certain that ours is the right answer. And we haven't published what we think is the answer yet. Any idea why that would happen? No, 
not at this stage. Remember, it's polymer, right? Eh? But it's high electrostatic fields there. Yeah, is there any like inductive magnetic fields? Not magnetic. Uh, they're not conductive, but there's charges. Eh? So there's electrostatic. So the model is this. This wire comes on the first post, highest electrical field, and then it wraps itself around it. What does that mean? Locally, the surface area increases. That means the field decreases. And it goes next to it because there's a gradient now. Field is lower here, field is higher next to it. And it can start traveling. And you can actually literally see it. It's really nice. See it hopping from post to post. It's like wiring itself through the post. So now we started being curious. By the way, we always converted that to carbon. And now we started being curious, what is the structure of this material? Now, if you paid attention, what is your expectation of that wire? In terms of shrinkage, it should be more than 80%. Right? And in terms of structure, it should be? Yeah, neither are true. And actually, they both indicate something truly fascinating that actually could open up a complete new electronics world with electrospinning these wires. So is it time now already? Is it? What? One more minute. One more minute. OK. <laughs> <coughs> So this happened, and I'll, that's my last minute, and keep you in suspense, a cliffhanger for uh, next class. Uh, with my team in Korea, and that's Ashutosh Sharma, and that's Swati. Uh, Swati worked for me two years in Korea, and she found the following thing. So you remember how we did electrospinning surface here, 10, 15 centimeters away, you have that needle. Now suppose you replace that surface by a drum. And that's what Swati did. So you use a drum, and now you come on with your needle, your electro spinning towards that drum. And on the drum, what we are putting there is this. We are putting, instead of two posts, two walls. And we are putting the fibers across that wall. Hmm? And so one day, Swati comes to me, and she says, uh, Mark, this wire doesn't shrink as much as it should. Remember, it should shrink 90%, right? It only shrunk like 40%. I said, OK, that's interesting. Do a TEM. And you know what she saw in the TEM? That I'm perfect graphitic. And so that is what we're going to come back to in next class. What has happened here? All of our expectations are violated. Doesn't shrink at all as we expected. And instead of glassy carbon, we are making graphite pure graphitic wires. At 960 degrees C, you can only form graphite around 2,600 degrees C. So something is going on, right? So let's continue this class uh, next. When am I teaching next? So tomorrow?